Welcome to the This Is Horror Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilson, the managing editor and owner of This Is Horror. And momentarily, I'll be joined by the deputy editor of This Is Horror, Dan Howarth. Today is part two of our interview with the award-winning author, Josh Malaman. If you'd like to listen to part one, it was episode 35 which was initially aired on March 17th. But the conversation doesn't really follow a linear pattern, so equally, if you'd like, then just get stuck in to part two, and then listen to part one retrospectively. Today we're going to continue talking about Bird Box, which was, of course, the novel of the year in the This Is Horror Awards. We're going to talk about adapting Bird Box for film. Readings in unusual places and much more. So let's jump in to the interview with Josh Malaman. And now for a horror interview. Well, you know what, though? You just, uh, Michael, you just gave me an idea where I, I may try to schedule like a reading around here in a very strange setting like you were describing. I, I hadn't thought of it like that. I, I was thinking bar or bookstore or, you know, and then how to, instead of thinking how to change the bookstore, why not just, you know, change the location to like a very, like a scarier, freakier place, like legitimately freakier place. Let's do a reading in like a, I don't know, there's a lot of abandoned, a lot of abandoned places around here so i'll tell tell you what josh you've got to do one where you put curtains over the windows you know the sheets pin them up over the windows like in the book oh yeah that'd really that'd really freak people out yeah oh you know what and then what about even what about even having friends you know not make noises outside the window but something like walk around i mean why not create the whole like sort of atmosphere oh you know which which kind of takes me to um, I don't know if you guys know this, but maybe I can't remember if you wrote about that or not. But Bird Box was picked up by Universal Studios. Did you guys know that? Yeah, that was one thing that we that we wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Okay, so you know, I I flew to Los Angeles actually to to do an interview with Porter Anderson, but while I was there, my manager set up a meeting between me and the producers um, that are spearheading Bird Box at Universal Studios. So. As you can imagine, man, I was horrified heading into this experience. I'm flying from Detroit to Los Angeles. It's my first book out. You know, first of all, I'm going to do this interview with Porter Anderson at a writer's convention. So we're doing that in front of a room full of people. That's scary enough. Then, then to be also, you know, going to sit down and and talk about Bird Box, the movie with these producers. These producers have done all these huge movies. You know, this was, this was, Scary and and Allison, my girl, she drops me off at the head of Universal Studios. I walk in, I get a I get a pass to enter, uh, and then I walk a, a long, long way down. I think it was called Jimmy Stewart Lane, and I walk down this like street, and and it's on the Universal lot, and and you know passing warehouses on either side of me where where uh, you know there's sound studios inside and trailers that are like costumes and. And in and, and a restaurant that has been on the lot for like 50 years for like the crew members and stuff. So you can imagine all the, you know, all the dudes who had like coffee, you know, before they went and shot like movies that we all love. You know what I mean? And it was just really this intense thing. And they didn't have um, like an office building back there. They had uh, what's it called? Um, bungalows. So each like producer sort of had their their own bungalow and their and their parking spot outside. This spot reserved for you know, and it's all these producer names, right? And I went to um, uh, the the guy that I met up with is Chris Morgan. I went to went to the, his office, and I show up. I'm trembling. I'm so freaking scared. And the secretary was like, um, "Oh, you're a half hour early." And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just I'll sit down. And she was like, no, well, maybe you should go take in the sights. And I was like, oh, uh, I, I should probably get out of here, huh? And she's like, yeah, just come back. And I, okay, okay. So I leave, 
And I just start walking around and I chanced upon this empty set of like New York City. I don't know what movie it was from. It had to be from a long time ago. And, and it, you know, there was like the baker and the bicycle shop and like, like brownstones. And, and I mean, I'm seriously walking around an empty, like six, seven, eight block set of New York City. <laughs> and, wow. and I'm like, you know, waiting to go meet with this guy. And it's like 80 degrees out. So, you know, I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm like sweating and nervous. I was so nervous I didn't even take any photos of, of the set I was on. I should have. I should have taken like a whole, should have done like a whole session, you know. And anyway, so time's up. I go back. I, I you know, I walk in. Oh, I'm, I'm here now. And when I got there, I was like the first, well, me and the screenwriter were the first two to arrive. And we walk into Chris Morgan's office. And Chris, I'm, I'm like six foot two and this guy's like a few inches taller than me. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't even, I don't even have height on this guy. You know what I mean? Like everything just felt like, I just felt like I was like shrinking. And I walked into his office and I look at the wall and he had all these like awesome horror novels, like on shelves on the wall. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, you know, Robert McCammon? He's like, oh yeah, no, I, I love Robert McCammon. I love that, you know, and we go over some names and all my nerves just vanished. That was it. They all dissipated, went away. I was like, oh man, I could, shoot, this is great. I could talk about this stuff with this guy forever, you know? And then all these, I think it was a total of like sort of six producers and myself and the screenwriter. And we sat around talking about Bird Box, the movie, and we looked at storyboards that were huge, these like elaborate awesome like graphic novel style like storyboards of the movie and and at some point and this is where I was leading with all this at some point Chris Morgan was like how do you you know see this movie being done and, and I was like you know I think this is an opportunity to do something that a movie never has really done before uh, because it sounds like the wrong thing to do which is which is showing nothing for periods of time I think that with today's surround sound systems, you know, you could have complete blackness on the screen. You could have the boy to your right, the girl to your left, Mallory in the middle, the river in the middle, the banks on your right, the banks on your left. And you can even screw with the panning. So suddenly the river's on the left and Mallory's on the right and everything's, you know, crazy, right? But, and, and I think that it's something that as a horror fan, I would be ecstatic to know that I was going into a movie that had periods of just blackness. Because number one, we would know that the next image we see is not going to be a good one, right? So it would be like pretty freaky to be in a pitch black theater with all these crazy sounds. And you're like, oh shit, what's gonna, what are they going to show next? You know, that sort of thing. And I mean, I just think Bird Box is like the story to be made into a movie that like, you know, has those kind of things. And after I go through this whole speech on why why, you know, this whole monologue and why I think the producers should show nothing on the screen. <laughs> I just stopped talking and I almost felt like my words just like fall to the carpet, you know? It was like, broom. Like, Josh, man, you just flew to Los Angeles to ask these producers to, to show a blank screen. <laughs> and and, and he, he actually seemed interested and they, they seemed interested and they, they talked about how they had been talking about stuff like that too. So we'll see if it goes in that direction. But to me, man, I, I just I know that the genre seems to like embrace like originality and, and first time events and first time attempts and that sort of thing. Oh, Burn Box, that's the movie that had twenty minutes of darkness. You know what I mean? Not twenty minutes in a row, but had like twenty total minutes of darkness, whatever, where the theater went black. I mean, if you can just imagine yourself as a 17 year old you know horror fan you're, you're stoned you go to the movie you sit down all these wild sounds all around you with a pitch black screen and then an image comes back on and it's it's not a it's not a great happy one and i mean what an experience what a horror experience that could be it sounds absolutely awesome i'm sold when when can we see it <laughs> yeah i know it's just you know well we will see i don't know if you guys read or not but the director of Mama um, was the original director attached and then he he I, he left because he was going to work on um, like a, a remake of The Mummy but not like the Brendan Fraser Mummy like he, it was a remake of like the Boris Karloff Mummy sort of stuff and 
So he was gone, then a different director was on board, then another director was on board, and another, and now Andres Machete is back on board. And it actually feel, it feels like it's, it's really, possibly really moving forward right now with him. And I know that he is interested in these kind of things also. So it, there's, there's a chance that, that Bird Box, the movie, could, could, could have this sort of like, you know, uniqueness to it or whatever. And then that's, I mean, you know, obviously that would be the greatest thrill I can imagine. For that's me, awesome. I think that filming Bird Box in black and white would be a great move because obviously, you know, like it, it's so pared down in many ways. I mean, the, there's not much in terms of like really kind of colorful over the oh, yeah. top descriptions. You, Absolutely. I mean, I mean you, you, you've almost gone for a, a minimalist approach and at the same time made these characters absolutely engaging and relatable which is a pretty tough thing to pull off but then indeed in in terms of not really being able to to see outside i feel you then want to remove something from the audience so if you put it in black and white for me that just works and i also think i mean you mentioned the Twilight Zone before. There is something very Twilight Zone about it. So what a great nod towards that to have yeah. the, the entire thing filmed in black and white. And again, Yeah, you know what? I, I can't even really, you probably know of one, but I can't even really think right now of the last like really sort of mind-blowing black and white movie. You know, you, you probably, maybe you know of one. I just can't really think of one offhand. Other than maybe like Woody Allen movies or something, even that that his last one was like in the nineties or something. But but black and white that's that's um, a way I've been describing this book for years. You know, my, I would talk to my friends and I would be like, oh, but you know, Bird Box Bird Box is a black and white book, and they and they and they they'd be like, oh, you mean it's like real like straight whatever? I'm like, no, no, no. I mean I mean that in the in the way that there are black and black and white movies, Bird Box is a black and white book, and the and the book that I'm working on right now is definitely in color, you know? And, and even possibly that, what do you call it? Um, What was it called when Hitchcock, it's called Technicolor? No, what was it called? Man, like Hitchcock was using stereoscope. I can't remember, but there was a certain certain look to like the um, late 50s Hitchcock movies that I feel like the book I'm working on now, it would be, the, would be shot that way. And, and I don't mean the movie of it, I mean the book itself, the images, that come to mind are in those colors. And so Bird Box, yeah, I, I always saw that as, you know, like, yeah, so, like what you, what you just described and, 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 and it's almost like um, pridefully colorless, you know? There, there's not a joke in that thing. There's hardly a description of a, a landscape. There's, har there's hardly a description of anything in there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That sounds like a really weird book all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of like a, a black and white film, the the kind of closest thing I can think of in recent memory that actually did a decent job of it was in Lars von Trier's Antichrist. The, oh, I haven't the, seen that. Well the, well, the opening scenes are in black and white now you know the rest of the movie isn't but it is in like kind of very dark colors but yeah that the the opening is in black and white and it is pretty traumatic <laughs> Those first did you um minutes. did you did he do nymphomaniac he did i haven't seen it yet but oh god i loved that movie man it is absolutely insane you, you gotta wa watch that one when you can i mean it's it's long and it's also, you know, it's the kind of thing. It's it's the kind of thing where like you never know exactly when's the right time to sit down and watch Nymphomania. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's like I, I went through that with Schindler's List for years. Oh, there's a black and white one. Yeah, I went through that with Schindler's List for years, where I kept wanting to watch it because you know I wanna I wanted to see it and I actually respect Steven Spielberg a lot actually and I, and I. I just never found the right time to sit down and finally I did and I'm like you know of course it was an afternoon you know. Um, when I was just alone, I was like, okay, now I'm going to watch Schindler's List. Well, obviously, Nymphomaniac's different subject matter, but holy shit, is that movie heavy. 
And real, I, I, my girl and I were talking about it last night, how I, I'm, it comes to mind, like, at least once a week, something from that movie pops up, you know, it, that is an intense freaking movie, man. But yeah, I can't really, I can't really think of a great modern one. And he seems like, it also seems like you don't have to imagine, like, there's, there's gradation in black and white, you know, you don't have to imagine the sort of Pleasantville black and white, you know? Like, imagine a, a more contrasting, a more saturated black and white for Bird Box, you know? Where it's more like shadowy and chiaroscuro and then that's sort of, you know what I'm saying? I think that if you sort of, where the black is very black and the white is very white, or, or that sort of contrast thing, almost, almost like certain effects that you can put on photos, you know, you know what I mean? Well, I, and, I, I think if you were to take it a step further... You could also then adjust the saturation levels based on the kind of levels of fear and trepidation that Mallory is feeling at that particular yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. It doesn't have to be a sort of static, you know, black and white. It can actually, there can be a gradation throughout the movie. I mean, that sounds, what we're describing right now sounds awesome. Yeah, we, we just, <laughs> just basically, we need to give uh, the producer of the movie this podcast. And it's like, look, yeah, it's, all, well, it's all here. We figured it out. <laughs> we, we figured it out, buddy. And I, you know, I, make I make sure working... we get our 10%, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I am working on a letter to, to send them a sort of, just to make, I just want to have the argument for a, a pitch black theater I want to have that on paper. You know what I mean. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna mail them a letter in the next week or so. The argument for a pitch black theater. <laughs> so this is the only podcast where we've taken a half time break. <laughs> 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 How are you doing? Are you all all ready? <laughs> yeah. I I am ready. Yeah, I think when we've done a uh, two parters before, either it's just been a very long podcast, or some of the ones we did with Richard Thomas, we literally scheduled, you know, for two separate days. Yeah, man, that guy is really something else, isn't he? Oh yeah, I mean he he's a great writer, and he's so knowledgeable on writing and then of course he's a brilliant editor as well um, yeah yeah and very I, generous with his time as well yeah i well i, I think again with, with the this is horror awards to go back to that it's a testament in terms of how good he is that burnt tongues won the anthology of the year and then the new black which he edited came as the runner-up <laughs> I just got both of those in the mail. Um, I just did a blurb for I, I don't know how to say this word e exigencies exigencies. How do you say that word? Yeah, I think yeah. it's exigencies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I did a I did a blurb for that um for that one. It was great, man. And then afterwards, I asked him. Or I didn't ask him. I, I just ordered the other the other ones. Yeah, Burnt Tongues and the New Black. And he also steered me towards um. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones after the people lights have gone off. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you about that actually. Yeah. So I just I read the first story that one in the movie theater, and uh, and that's where that's I am with that one. A brilliant story. Well, that <laughs> yeah. that won the short story collection of the year, and it was the end in all beginnings that was the runner up for that. So oh, man, the end in all beginnings is so good. Oh yeah, so right. good. That's one of my fa that's one of my favorite horror novels I've read in or horror books whatever you want to call it that I've read in a, in a while man John, John F D Tapp is I just wouldn't be surprised if this guy like does something that is like a, like a classic of the genre if he hasn't already you know I, I wouldn't be surprised that if to see that come from him like there's just just something you know I was reading uh, the end and all beginnings and at first I was like oh I've never you know never really read a voice like this or whatever and then. I realized, like, oh, man, I've never read a voice like this, you know? Like, whatever it was was his own thing, and and every story was so different, but then the handoff from novella to novella seemed, like, very well, very well ordered, you know? And it sort of just started to, like, build on me, and by the end, I mean, I was, like, 
sending like people links. I was reading passages to my girlfriend. I was, you know, just I, I was smitten by that one. Well, I very much got the impression that as with your own writing that John isn't afraid to experiment. I mean, in terms of finding his own voice and bringing something different, you have yep. you have some parts in the same novella that are very pacey, very quick, back and forth, minimalist dialogue. And then in seemingly, you know, the, the, the same bit, you'll then have a couple of pages of really specific intricate description almost poetry like and it, these yeah. are things that y you wouldn't see um married together very often and yet yeah. it works <laughs> there, there really is something like poetic about that book you're right i i, I don't know exactly what it is i almost, you know what i think I, I i don't do this very often but i, I think i'm gonna reread that one again because i just want to be able to i don't know you, you know how sometimes you read the book to experience it, and then you read it to like see how it was done. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I think I want to kind of go that second round with it to, to kind of like study it. You know? Yeah, and I I certainly imagine back to Bird Box that that is what a lot of people have done with your own novel because it's the kind of novel that ends. You see, yeah, you see the ending, and you think, ah, okay, now I want to go back to how it all began particularly because it's only really in the last quarter that the present scenes and what why Mallory and her children are on this boat ride if you want to call it that what why why <laughs> that happened how it kind of how how the pieces of that puzzle all came into play you, you know there there was a certain juggling act with a, with a few with certain sections of the book because it, it pretty much remains now the order that the rough draft was written in you know mm -hmm. um in terms of time uh timelines flipping back and forth and the actual scenes themselves that that occurred or that happened whatever and but there were a couple moments that it was a bit of a juggling act um the one that always comes to mind is when tom and jules take the dogs to go for that three mile walk to tom's house then the next scene is Mallory in the bar with Victor. And then with what happens to Victor, when we return to the housemates waiting for Tom and Jules to return with the dogs, that was, you know, that was sort of a juggling act to make, to, to make it so that, hopefully, the reader would be extra worried now about Tom and Jules being outside with dogs after experiencing what Mallory experienced with Victor in the bar. And there, there were, it was weird because you would be informing the past with scenes of the present, you know, versus the other way around or something. Um, and, and there were, yeah, so there was, there was definitely some, yeah, some, some sort of sleight of hand with, with those kind of moments. And so when you initially wrote it, did you know exactly what Mallory was doing? Or in its kind of infancy, the idea... Did you think, right, she's in the boat, two children, all blindfolded. I don't exactly know what's going to happen, but this is a good starting point. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly how it started. The, the, um, opening, the opening scene was, was actually, the original draft started with them on the river already. And they, so if you could just skip the very, very beginning where now she wakes them up and tells them they're going. It just started with them on the river and... Yeah, I just had an image of a, you know, it just seemed like a, like a striking thing. A woman traveling down a river blindfolded and, and like the perils of that and to have two kids on board. But then, you know, that literally that was three pages in when I'm like, okay, what are, what are they doing? What, what are they fleeing? Blah, blah, blah. And then I had a sort of, you know, distinct memory of um, w once when I was uh, – 13 or so, a teacher had mentioned to our class that a, um, a man might go mad if he attempted to contemplate infinity. And I remember I was 13 years old, and that night 
Uh, I, I was sitting in this hallway upstairs while my family was getting ready for dinner, like to go out to dinner. Mom and dad are walking back and forth, my two brothers. And I remember just sitting there like saying, okay, the, the word I think that scared me the most was attempting to fathom infinity. And so I sat there like, okay, if I, if I think too hard about where space ends, am I going to go crazy? You know, I was like 13 years old and I was very nervous about like losing my mind over, over thinking about too much about where space ends. And, you know, somehow whatever got through that night. And then um, years later, you know, I have this woman traveling down a river blindfolded and I'm like, man, what is she fleeing from? And, and then if we jump back to what we said we were talking about earlier and the trying without trying too hard to come up with abstract monsters, I remembered that, that feeling of that <clears throat> sitting in that hallway and what the teacher said. I was like, oh, ah, ah, maybe, maybe Mallory is fleeing infinity or she's fleeing an unfathomable concept um and that's why she's blindfolded because if she gazes upon it that was you know that you know infinity personified if she gazes upon it then that's in a sense um your brain would try of course to make sense of it and like the teacher said a man who tries to make sense of infinity can go mad so that that sort of fit like that just slid right in there to be honest with you and like i said you know wrote that rough draft 26 days that that i did not enter that rough draft with an outline so to start on day one without even knowing about the quote-unquote like infinity angle but to discover it on like the, you know the evening of night one falling asleep and then to wake up and 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 work, start working in on day two that was like a that was a kind of a lucky break because you know in terms of writing you know, I mean, there, there, there could be something that kind of holds you up for a month. And, and then if that's two months, then you start to think, what else do I got? And if it's three months, you, you may never come back to it again. You just don't know, you know? So, so yeah, that, that is absolutely the, the genesis moment of Verbox was wrote Mallory in the river, went laying in bed, remember the thing about the teacher and was like, ah, ah, Mallory, she's sling infinity, fell asleep and then and woke up and, and, you know, the, the book just like ballooned from there. And is that how many of your story ideas start off with more an image or a very rough idea and then almost <coughs> this, yeah. frenetic, <clears throat> this frenetic writing that we spoke about previously and then once you've, you know, got that out onto the page, then it's time to actually think more about the intricacies of story and structure and putting together a a more um well i guess a more just conventional narrative in the sense that it's one that someone might be able to navigate <laughs> yeah ab absolutely um, usually there might be like a couple landmark moments um like i knew in bird box i needed to get from Mallory arriving at the house to the birth scene, right? Uh, that's obviously a lot happens between those two moments, but that, you know, that's, that's, I guess, part of writing a novel is bridging the landmark scenes that you have in mind, you know, the ones that excited you enough to write the story in the first place, right? Um, let's say, for example, Gasoline Yule, that, um, that was more of like just a a singular like concept like oh I like the idea of two like warring horror filmmakers because that was interesting to me two guys that two artists that are obsessed with each other and because of what they're doing like their genre they kind of have <laughs> liberty to act not not to act out violence towards each other but to 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 sort of be like frantic angry violent colorful strange in their works works of art trying to outdo each other. So that seemed like a great to me, uh, um, like like uh, pitting two artists against each other. The horror genre seemed like a great place to do that. In the same way that it would be great to pit like two surrealists, you know, against each other, um, because the sky's the limit on what they could do, right? Um, it would be. It seems like a tremendously boring idea to imagine two realists trying to outdo each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining too, my story is more real. I found a hole in, in Mark's story, you know. That's not very realistic at all. Nobody would shave at four in the afternoon, you know. So 
so that so Gaslit Newell didn't start with quote unquote landmark scenes, but it did start with like just a concept, you know, like like an idea, and and that actually kind of goes back to like the songwriting versus the book thing. Whereas could Gaslit Newell have been a, a song? Yeah, yeah, that one would have worked, you know, like two uh, filmmakers that are obsessed with each other. That that's a fun little song without crossing sort of into that like. I don't know that that territory that d- hasn't worked for me that horror song. So, but um, when I started working on it, you know, and right away uh, with the first movie mention, like the movie that Gas and Newell were both working on, that Bill Ferris's uh, Black Wheel of Black Blood. Right away, right there, I realized ah, this this story can go. This story can be as as broad or as um, big or as small as you want it because. You can talk about as many movies as you want to. You know what I mean? And then that was sort of like once that that structure or something was set up, that then things were, you know, whatever. Then it just flowed from there, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it starts oh. off as almost a love letter to horror cinema. Um, and then rapidly descends into this nightmare and starts to get you know, pretty damn scary by the end of it. <laughs> um, but with... I love the uh, the kind of hammer horror feel that it had to it as well. That kind of you know sixties, seventies groundbreaking filmmakers who were you know above and beyond people's conceptions and the way that people think about film. I thought I just thought it had a really kind of uh retro vibe to it really i thought you did a great job of kind of channeling an era that's particularly looked upon with a lot of fondness by british genre fans anyway oh yeah same well thanks first of all yeah that same same here yeah you guys got you guys had a hammer like front and center in like the 60s and 50s and so that's that's amazing to me um but yeah no you know originally it was like does this happen you know should this story happen in the modern era and then i'm like no 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 because it's going to sound insane, but almost because of all the CG stuff, it was like I don't want these. Guys to, I don't want this story to be about two guys like you know, like sitting at computers the whole time. You know what I mean? I want well, this. This is going to be about two guys like out in the <laughs> field and, and like trying to like you know, like oh they pulled off the bloody like museum scene. Well, nowadays that wouldn't be too hard. You know, I, I mean it's hard and it takes work, whatever. But to imagine them like, it seemed like there was a certain performance art of carrying out the special effects themselves back in those days you know and you can only imagine yeah you know like an actual horror movie like we've all read interviews with tom savini and the way he makes it sound like you know it, it was like there if you were on set during the movies tom savini or, or any really effects guy did it must have felt like an actual like performance art moment like where they had to get this right for the camera whatever and so that sort of uh, that sort of uh, precarious you know balance thing that that sounded fun for Gaslin you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it because it was a, a BBC thing, but have you ever seen um, the documentary series A History of Horror by a guy called Mark Gatiss? No, but... If you, if you get a chance to that check that out, out it kind of yeah, brought it down, that to so mind yeah. for me. Yeah, it's, it's called A History of Horror. And by... Mark Gatiss, it's uh, G-A-T-I-S-S, I think. Cool. Okay. And it's, guys- uh, it kind of talks about like ha- uh, Hammer and Amicus and, you know, how they were kind oh, of Amicus, pushing the, the boat out and stuff. Like, and that Gasol and Yule really put me in, in mind of that. I thought it was, you know, I think that's be right up your street if you want to check it out. Sweet. I, I will. I may even check that out at, at, right after this. <laughs> 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 Go on, Michael. I think I, uh, I think I cut across you before. I'm sure you had something. Well, I like how then. how with Gasol and Yule, there's the blurring between uh, reality and what is just hearsay, what is legend, and I mean, what one of my favourite bits was just where there's there's rumour that one of them kidnapped a child, <laughs> took him to the mountains of Alberta set him free and just filmed the boys attempts at survival and uh, like 
that just really stuck with me. And I also thought, there's a whole story within that. You know, you could conceivably... <laughs> you could write the novella of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Abs- man, actually, you're right. That one would. That one actually has legs. You're right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It, it, sometimes when I read... Oh, did you guys... I don't know if you know that Gas O'Neill came out in the UK paperback, like that it's printed. Did you guys know that? that it's yeah, in, it's, in the, uh, it's in the paperback version of Bird Box now, isn't it? Is, is that where you guys read it? You didn't read it on Kindle. You read like the so paperback. No, no, I, I downloaded it. Yeah, I, re- I read okay. the Kindle edition, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. because it's it was like, you know, a thrill for me to open the... I mean, they told me they were going to do it, but to open the... Um, the UK paperback and see like the title page Gasol and you, I'm like, Oh my God. You know what I mean? It was like mind blowing. And, um, but it is a little old for me to read that one because of course it makes me want to go make by Cameron Island. It makes me want to go mm-hmm. make curate your own death. You know, though I, I feel like on paper, I'm more of a Yule fan. Like his ideas are just more like, I don't know, like, colder and stranger and they just sound like i would run to the video store to rent those movies the you know the the market and by caramel island and beast fucker i would like totally totally run but then i i feel like if i had gas movies in front of me too i would be like oh man maybe i like this guy better it's kind of like we're like sometimes we take like someone like steven spielberg for granted you know and we're like oh yeah of course he's great oh yeah yeah whatever but let's talk about someone more interesting right and then you really sit down and watch Spielberg stuff, and you're like, "Fuck, this guy's great." And and I wonder, like, I feel like Gasol has a little more of like that side in him, the more, a little more for like the masses, where Yule's more more of a rogue. So you're going to get a crazy fan now message you and be like, you know, how dare you say that you prefer the work of Yule? <laughs> it's clearly Gasol is the greater artist <laughs> of the two. <laughs> It's all going to kick off from here. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard not to fall for an animatronic cast on a a deserted island, though, you know? It's hard not to want to see that movie. (laughs) I I think it's very difficult to rival a film called Beast Fucker. I mean, who who wouldn't want to see that movie? (laughs) But I, I mean, so one of my questions was going to be whether... You had written the screenplay or indeed a short story version of any of the uh, films referenced in Gasol and Yule, or if that was a project you would consider for the future, even if just an experimentation in creative writing. Uh, haven't done it yet. Would absolutely would absolutely entertain that or even, you know, really try to pull it off in the future. Um, you know, I go through, through, I've gone through each of them and like thought and, and a couple of them, it seems like, um, in terms of actually making the movie seem like insane, like curate your own death. I would, oh God, we got to get a museum and by camera Island, like, man, we would need a, uh, freaking um, uh, right, animatronic cast in the market. Like we need like a city in a market, but then, um, pale people blush too, where the where the kid is raised by mannequins while the parents sort of observe in the other room. All right, well maybe we could pull that off. And, and wigs, uh, Gassel's one about the woman, you know, increasingly obsessed with appearances, whatever. That that could be done. And what was I can't remember Gassel's first one right now. The one I can't remember the name of it. Where um, sleep paralysis, the one with blur face. The the, the demon in the girl's room whose face is never really fully in focus or whatever. We could maybe pull that one off. So I, I have actually like gone through these and, and considered them, you know, in that way. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I'm so excited about writing the next book or the next novella or whatever that it's like to write a script for By Cameron Island just seems like that. It's like fucking like 10th on the list or something, you know? Yeah, I actually had written a note saying, you know, uh, observing the similarity between Blurface and, of course, not seeing the evil as it were within bird box <laughs> i just oh let me that tell parallel. you michael that is one of the we- and maybe you've gone through this too both of you but when when you start to have like a canon a body of work it's like it's very strange when you notice themes because or things that recur because 
I don't think any of us like sit down and be like, I'm the kind of guy who's troubled by my fear and I'm going to write about, you know what I mean? But then you see like that, re, like that sort of thing, like recurring, you know, I had a sort of a three, three books in a row that I now call my bad dad phase. I'm not a dad. So it must've been about my dad. And it was, it was like, it was like all of a sudden I looked and I was like, huh, man, that's three books in a row that kind of deal with like, like really weird father figures, you know? And and that that's just like it's almost alarming to notice recurring themes because it's like oh shit that's who I am Let, let's not pay too much attention to that. <laughs> well, I believe in the initial draft that Chuck Polo Nick wasn't aware of how many dildos he'd put into Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> that that would be a more example. exciting thing to discover about myself. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Oh, I appear to be putting dildos into my fiction. <laughs> yeah, I just lowered the tone. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're Dan and I are like do do. No, yeah, that sounds more colorful than than a bad dad phase. Yeah. You want to really lower the tone? Combine bad dad phase with too many dildos. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Josh, I thought we were taking the moral high ground and leaving Michael hanging with the dildos. Now, now, we're, now we're implicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite a rare exception to see you taking any sort of moral stance, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any writers that you would say intimidate you in terms of when you're reading their work and you think oh man that's just like so well crafted or they they just do something that aesthetically really resonates and it's something that you know you, you aspire to or, or inspires your own writing man that question is so much better than the who than the, any writers that influence you or that that kind of you know what I mean. Mm. That question is magnificent. Um, are there any writers that intimidate? Holy cow! Yeah, you know, like I I read um, not that long ago. I read Flowers in the Attic, and I read online that that Flowers in the Attic that we all know or that everyone knows is was her rough draft, like. She made a few, like, you know, spelling corrections after the rough draft or something. And reading that book, knowing that, was like watching somebody pull off, like, a physical feat that you just aren't capable of, you know? It, it was like, no, no, no way. This is her rough draft? This is the first go-round of this? That, that I mean, it just makes you feel like she's, like, tapped into something that you just don't know, you know? It's like... Uh, you read the same thing about Stephen King. I heard the Running Man. He wrote that in like in like a weekend and didn't change much. And and I, he, I, th I think recently I read that he he said something about the dark t the last three Dark Tower books were all like essentially the rough drafts. And you're just like, man, what? What? You know, the, those are especially intimidating moments for me because I. I want to be able to put out books with like regularity and then to think that if you don't have that thing that I'm talking about right now, that sort of initial like grasp and it takes like, you know, carving and work and work and work, like how long is it going to take between releases? Do you see what I mean? So, so in an, I guess that's not a very artistic answer. Um, but Stephen King is definitely one of those um, where, you know, whether or not you, you like, whether or not he's your favorite or whether or not you think a lot of his books end wonky or whatever it is. I mean, the man really has a grasp on something. He has a rhythm that, I mean, it's really hard not to just like fall right in and dance with him from the word go. I mean, like from page one of every one of his books, you know, I feel that way about Agatha Christie. I feel that way about, um, like I said, flowers in the attic. And then there are guys who wrote something that is so Oof, like, you know, like really dark, like Jack Ketchum. Um, I, well, the first time I read The Girl Next Door, when I started it, I was like, oh, this is this is kind of like it almost felt like like one of the beats or something. 
there was something so so down to earth about it and so so i don't know uh what's the word i don't want to say realistic because that, that word always freaks me out but there's something so like real life about it or whatever and then where it ends up going oh man oh man and the girl next door like screwed me up have you guys read that one? Oh yeah it's amongst my favorite books it's- I yeah, that, his Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that one just holy cow did something to me. And there was that was a different kind of intimidation because there are guys like Nabokov, um, like uh, Fitzgerald, like Truman Capote, who who are writing. The it's so fluid that it almost feels like they're like like they're swimming or something in language, you know, like. Sometimes I think that real genius is like fluid, like Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys and, and Mozart. It's like it's, just, it's like almost like playful. You know what I mean? Even if it's a horror story or whatever. Then there are guys like Beethoven or um, Jack Ketchum where it's like, oh, boy, this isn't playful. And I'm not sure that I could trace like the roots of this. Like, I'm not sure that I could point to where this came from in terms of how the story was told and the feeling that I'm getting from this story. Like where, how, like where the hell did this come from? Is this just something he was born with? Is this something like just something that he's like really crafted? Um, I, I, you know, I don't know enough about him to know if the girl next door, that's one of his earlier books, right? Yeah. 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 So that one in like off season. Right. So, so I'm just kind of like, Though that becomes especially intimidating because then you're like, well, shit, does this guy just have like a spark that I'm unable to achieve no matter how much I write? Do you see what I mean? And then it becomes kind of like a scary, almost insecure thought. But then there's other, there's, there's like things with like bird box are happening right now. It's, you know, up for a Stoker award. And so I'm going through and reading the other books that are nominated for a first novel also. And I'm reading J.D. Barker's Forsaken. And I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm like, oh man, shoot, this is so good, you know? And your initial instinct is like, oh no, it's great. What am I going to do, you know? And then you sort of realize like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is great. And it's nominated for the same award that Bird Box is. In fact, I hope that every one of these books is mind-blowing. And so far, that's the case. So it's like, Okay, I read Jack Ketchum, and it's like, yeah, it's a little intimidating, man. And and I read, you know, uh, the end and all beginnings, and this J.D. Barker book, and and Clive Barker, and you know, all these giants. But then you say to yourself, like, there, there's room for everybody. Like, I, there's room for me up, up there or in here. I, I can, I can enter this room and not be too, too scared of everyone. In fact, I should be, I should be really, really excited that I'm welcome in this room at all. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think seeing other writers whose work you admire or you get really into just validates your own work when you're on, you know, when you're shortlisted for the same award. Yeah, yeah, it really, you know, uh, David Cronenberg's up there for first novel, isn't that, did you see that on the Stoker ballad? He also, he wrote his first novel and that's up there for first novel. That's like, man. Cronenberg is one of all of our favorite like filmmakers of all time. It's just, it's just interesting. It's sort of, it's like encouraging and like you say, intimidating at the same time. I think that obviously it's a matter of how you react to being intimidated, right? Are you going to be like, Oh fuck, maybe I should be an accountant instead. Or are you going to be like, okay, all right, whoa, that book was really good. And what you're doing is really good too. I think a key phrase as an artist to say to yourself is there's room for everybody Um, because if like you're in a band and some other rock band does really well okay great it's not the only rock band that's doing well there's room for everybody and especially in today's day and age where there's like so many outlets for music for for art for writing all these things you know between self-publish and 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 novella collections I mean just whatever there's so many different outlets that there's like there truly is room for everybody. There isn't an allotted amount of spaces that are filled right now and you have to wait for like Jack Ketchum to retire. No, like you can join him in that room if you just like keep writing. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I think what it is with 
the girl next door is that it's it's almost like having a conversation with someone at a bar. It's that kind of colloquial, uh, neighbourly almost language. And that, that that's almost very seductive as well. And so yeah. then that, that lures you into to the world, almost falsely leads you into what you believe to be a safe environment. But by the time you're in there, you can't get out. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, you want to hear a funny story is that I started reading, when I started reading it, I started reading it to Allison. And we and it was going to be like, oh, this is a book we read together. You know, I'll, I'll read it out loud to her at night. You know, we go to bed. Pretty soon I realized, no, I don't think this is the book for that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, honey, I read I read ahead. I read a couple chapters last night. I, I, don't, I don't think this is that book. You should definitely read it, and I will definitely read it, but I, I think I want to be alone with this one. <laughs> well, I've, I've said this before, but my favorite chapter, I believe it is just one line. So he's detailed all these horrific things that has happened to the girl, and then there's a chapter that says, effectively... And I cannot repeat what happened next. <laughs> oh, oh man, yeah, yeah, that is. Oh man, oh man, I, I, I've never wanted to reach into a book so, so much in my life and just like stop that mom from doing what she was doing. I, I've never wanted to reach like, like to to leap into a book and rescue someone before, you know, like I did with that one. I, I wanted to like go into that house and open the door and just get her the hell out of there. <laughs> And have you read the book by Mendel Johnson, Let's All Play at the Adams, which was based on the same case as The Girl Next Door? No, I've never heard of this. I mean, it, it's a little known book. Mendel Johnson only wrote one book. That was it. And yeah, it, it's based off the same case, but just didn't get as much publicity in fact it's not i'm just looking it up now it's not let's all play at the adams it's let's go play at the adams and i mean it it's a little bit more dated than the girl next door but i would argue it's just as effective so it's based wow. on it's based on the same case it's almost like like riffing off the same thing, but they've came to a slightly different conclusion. I I it, read I read it after I'd read The Girl Next Door and still got a lot out of it. Oh my god! I can't believe that you're telling me there's another way for me to go back into that story. I can't. I can't. I can't and, and I can't, also can't believe that I I'm probably gonna do it. I'm probably gonna read that book now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 year did it come out? Is it before Girl Next Door? Yeah, it came out in 1984. This, this is interesting. The Girl Next Door came out in 1989. So, Let's Go Play at the Adams was actually five years previous. Wow. Yeah. The one I want to read by him is one called Red. Have you read that one? I haven't. Red, red. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, that one seems really interesting to me. Some, some old old man and his dog, or something. But you yeah. know, what, man, you know what this guy is gonna. Whew. I There's mean, just something he he just has. Like I was saying with Stephen King and and uh, really all of our most of our favorites and John F. D. Taft too. It's like these guys have like their own beat. You know, they got like their own rhythm or something. And I think, I think that's like. First of all, I think that really all of us probably do, and I think the novel is the, sort of like the the least, uh, or or it, it's a it's a medium where it's impossible to hide your rhythm. Even if you're trying to ape someone else, it's like, man, it's too revealing to hide in a novel. You don't have a drummer to hide behind. You don't have a a, a movie star to to read your lines. You know what I'm saying? It's like you, and you may have a great editor, but still, th this is your you're on display when you write a book. You know in the tiniest ways, you know, the whole thing where if you and I were given the same exact subject, 
well, like Jack Ketchum and that other guy, um, they would come out like differently, right? So, but Jack Ketchum, whenever that beat is, that rhythm, it just, honestly, it makes you feel like you walked into a really, like you walked into a room that you just shouldn't be in, you know? <laughs> Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. We'll be reconvening with Josh for part three, the final part of our interview. So with that said, have a great evening. And remember, there's still time to pre-order The Visible Filth by Nathan Ballingrood. Take care. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes. You'll be able to find the This Is Horror shop at thisishorror.co.uk and also at thisishorror.co.uk. In the right-hand navigation, you can sign up for our This Is Horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.